Ms. McOsker? Here. Councilmember Padilla? Here. And Councilmember Soto Martinez? Here. Three members and a quorum. All right, we have a very straightforward agenda today. I am going to propose before we go to public comment, which I don't see any of yet, although I'll give you a chance to sign up. I'm gonna propose that we take items one, two on consent. I'm gonna ask we continue item three, we'll discuss item four, we'll put five on consent, discuss item six and seven. And with that, um, let's go to public comment. Uh, chair, I mean, I am the chair, right? Uh, can you um, uh, read the rules for public comment? And whoever is controlling this device, can you tell me if there's any speakers on the list? Oh, well. Okay, I'll give you one last chance. Anyone want to speak on public comment? Hearing none, we will move on then. Uh, let's move to the consent agenda, which again is item one, item two, item four. Five. Can you read the roll? Thank you, Councilmember Mick Cosker. Yes. Councilmember Padilla. Yes. And Councilmember Soto Martinez. Yes. These items are um, uh, approved as stated. Thank you very much. Um, and if there's no objection, we will continue item three. And let's move to item four. Can you read item four into the record? Thank you. Item number four is a report from the personnel department relative to the LA Well Program Employee Benefits Trust Fund review for fiscal year 2022 and 23. Thank you very much. We are joined by personnel department. Thank you. Could pull the, the microphone close and maybe press the button. Uh, there you go. So Paul Mikowski from the Personnel Department Employee Benefits Division. Thank you very much. Could you, could you give us a brief report and then we'll have some discussion and questions. Sure. So the Employee Benefits Division manages the LEWL program, which is the program for uh, providing uh, medical, dental, vision, a whole bunch of hosts of uh, benefits to employees. Mm -hmm. um, it is um, actually under the authority of the Joint Labor Management um, uh, Committee, and they are the trust of the fund. Um, money goes into the fund to be able to pay all the premiums and everything else that's hosted by the program. On an annual basis, uh, the, uh, the JLMBC, the Joint Labor Management uh, Committee, uh, reviews the, the trust fund and is required by ADCO to provide a report of the status of the fund to council. And so that's what this report provides is a, st a status of the financial of the fund. Great, thank you. What, what would you, what do you estimate is sort of the range of, um, of balance uh, to be able to perform the programs you want to perform? Mm, could you ex explain a little bit more what you mean by that? How much money, how much money do you need in the fund? When, when are you uncomfortable okay. with how little it is and? and uh, well, well, the fund is actually, the all the revenue that you see coming from the fund is coming from the general fund. So we're borrowing money from tax dollars, putting it directly into the special fund to be able to pay our debts for premiums. The only money that is not coming from general tax dollars is the line that says reimbursement from other funds. That's coming from the proprietary departments, uh, Harbor and Lawa, uh, as mm -hmm. well as the pension and lasers. But everything else is general tax dollars. So we're taking, we're transferring money on a regular basis to pay that. Um, what we're seeing, though, is with increase in premiums, increasing costs year after year after year, an increase in growth or an increase in need to be able to spend more. So we saw a 10% increase in premiums this past year uh, for 2024. We're seeing that as a, as a continuing basis. So what you see for expenditure here, the $400 million um, that we spent this year in premiums is expected to continue to increase. Great. great. So um, uh, do you sit on the, uh, the JLMBC? I, I do not. I am staff. I, I manage the program. Uh, JLMBC is on the management side. It is uh, the general manager of um, general services, personnel department. Um, we have the CAO who sits on that on the management side, as well as uh, Rec and Parks. I'm forgetting somebody right now. Um, for on the labor side, it's represented by uh, SEIU, uh, FESME, um, EA, EAA, and then we have two other um, uh, management uh, labor members. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. So the sort of the contours of this program go through the JLMBC. Correct. Mm -hmm. And the would you say that the biggest issue in front of the JLMBC is the the uh, the periodic uh, evaluations and approvals of the of the health benefit plan? You mean of, of the cost? Yeah. I, I would say cost is the hardest thing. So so we've had it. We've had um, these programs and services go out to bid uh, on a regular basis. We have up to five years on the ADCO before we have to go back out to bid. We've been having a, a, a difficult time, I would say, over the past 
few cycles of being able to attract new companies to come and actually compete for business. Mm. Um, so it's been, and then uh, all the companies that are competing or that actually do come through are saying the same thing over and over time and time again, that they have high cost, that they have difficulty in being able to do things. And so they can't really do much for us as far as, as giving different prices and different options. We are considering, the, the committee is meeting and, and looking at different ways to be able to, to change the program, to be able to make differences towards batting that increased cost. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is an ongoing problem Great. that the committee is facing. Members, questions? Oh, yeah, I have a question. Go ahead. Um, I don't know what the proper term would be, but what's like your, do you know what your user ability rate is? Like how many people actually take advantage of going onto LA Well um, oh. and engaging on the website and consistently asking themselves questions and, you know, calling to explore what the options are? Well, well I can tell you uh, for open enrollment, we actually have a very low uh, amount of people that physically make actions and physically make changes. So we have a passive open enrollment, which we just started a couple days ago. Open enrollment is from October 1st to 31st. Um, it is less than 25% of our members actually go in and make a change. Um, they're able to, we have our set program set up where you don't have to do anything. If you're happy with your coverage and you're happy with how things work, uh, you can keep the same benefits, no action needed from you. Uh, and that's what the majority of our members do. They, they, they essentially set it and forget it and, and don't do anything. Um, we've also had, because of kind of the, the issues that I talked about before, we've had pretty stagnant uh, benefits. We haven't had changes in our benefit options. So that's also contributed to, uh, in part, to why members might not be interested in making uh, an active choice or an active look into things. Um, but we try to, to educate as much as we can on, on what their options are and what their choices are. Got it. And when, um, of that 25% or when they do, uh, what is it that they're usually uh, most trying to unpackage? Medical, dental, life insurance? Uh, that, that they varies. pay most attention to. Yeah, yeah that, that really varies by the individual. It's hard to say. Uh, what we can see is that sometimes people will be making changes because of changes to family that they didn't make when they actually had the life event. So under this plan is a, an, an internal revenue code. So by it being an internal revenue code 125 plan, we as the employer are able to get pre-tax benefits. Uh, so there's strict rules and strict processes into how we operate the plan to be able to get, get that pre-tax benefit. Um, and so there is a, also a part of that strict rule is when people can make changes. So you can only make a change to your benefits if you're within 30 days of a life event, which means you got married, you had a kid, something like that to that degree, a major event, or open enrollment. And so lots of times we see employees not realizing that they wanted to make a change when they had that life event. They call us on day 90 or they call us you know, later on and we say, oh, sorry, you're outside the window. You can't do anything. You have to wait till open enrollment. And so we see some people making changes to their, to their family status at that time, uh, but maybe not making actual changes to the benefits. Out of our structure, there's only two uh, benefits that someone has to physically enroll into each year. That's our tax advantage accounts. Uh, that's under IRS regs. You have to physically make an election that year. Otherwise, you lose. Uh, it, otherwise, you can't participate. And then that's a user to lose a plan. You participate in it and you don't use it. You, you lose that money. Um, so we see that uh, that enrollment happen on a regular basis. But that's only a couple thousand people. Interesting. And I'm curious, who's it? who would be the the holder of that because you're talking about a lot of stuff. You're talking about a lot of different dates and a lot of things to know. Who would be the holder of sort of that checklist? Would it be benefits? Would, would it be human resources related to making sure that every employee um, has had some kind of thorough or at least um, acceptable uh, understanding of what all the options are? Mm -hmm. Because 25% of user ability is pretty it's, it's pretty low by, by what I think it should be, especially for uh, an employer that actually has a good plan, uh, but you know, uh, people that are engaged in their health, in their benefits are consistently checking and consistently looking. Right. So um, I'm just a little, well, what's the answer? Who would have, who would have that checklist? So, so I would say us, uh, my, my division, my uh, program, uh, the LOL program that I'm managing, um, it should be coming to us. Um, what we see, though, is we see sometimes, you know, employers, since the city is so decentralized, um, maybe not necessarily giving that message out as concretely of talk to benefits, call benefits. Maybe they, uh, they give them information that might be a little bit outdated. Uh, so we try to correct that as quickly as possible. But I would argue that trying to get employees to go directly to us at all times uh, for this program is the, the best method. 
Okay, so um, so it's very decentralized. I meant the hiring process and like how HR works, right? So okay. the benefits program is uniquely within the personnel department, but HRs are spread out and, and happen uh, throughout every department a little bit differently. So how do we turn you guys into more of an umbrella to make sure that every single HR department is on top of making sure people understand the depth of their benefits? Try, I, I guess the best way is to try to get each HR to, to know the message and to make sure that they're giving out the same message. Okay. Um, Which our message is, is tell them to visit our website, go to keepinglawell.com. Uh, that's, that's the message that we're trying to get to tell all employees. Okay. Well, you know, I, I I apologize because I could go on forever, but it has a lot to do with uh, my own uh, experience with onboarding a new team and staff into into council. So I'm just curious if it was difficult for me to figure out a lot of stuff for my own team. I'm curious how a lot of departments are are you know working on making sure that employees are actually engaging and understanding the depth of what we we provide. Um, it's so, um, I want to continue this conversation. Okay. It's great. It's very no helpful. Questions. Thank you. Actually, I had one other before I turn, okay. if you don't mind. Can you, um, uh, just explain to me attachment A and attachment B? We have on the, um, the available balance on A is, uh, 2.8 million and on attachment B, it looks like the validated net assets, um, are 3.8 uh, million. Yeah, and, and and this is a historical document. We've been giving the same document uh, time after time. In all honesty, probably we should drop attachment B in the future. Okay. But attachment A and attachment B are saying the same thing. It's the same numbers. They're just they're shown in a different way. Uh -huh. um, so attachment A is the overall balance for the year. It's where we started um, off uh, in the trust fund, what we brought into the trust fund, and, and how we stand with it after liabilities. Um, Attachment B is looking at a, a year back, a look back, uh, just with a lot of bulk of that uh, money going in and out uh, removed. Essentially, mostly the carrier payment just removed. So there's 1.1 1. 1. 1 million essentially that gets, or 1.1 1. 1 million that essentially gets removed out of attachment B? Uh, uh, more than that. Uh, it's not reflecting a, a big chunk of money, right? The the almost $400 million worth of in and out that happened during that that actual year is not being reflected in attachment B. It came so in I should outside. rely on attachment A. Correct. Maybe we eliminate attachment B. I Un agree. Unhelpful information. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for being here, Paul. Um, I'm looking at attachment A and looking at 306 million in revenues going. Does that come in once a month or is it like, or like once a year? How those does are transfers over time. So, so that over the whole year, those are transfers from the general fund into the, the trust fund. And are those based on like hours worked or number of people worked? It's, uh, and neither. It's actually based on what we need to be able to pay um, to oh, be okay. able to keep our, our premiums paid. So the premiums, the way the, the program works, right, they're going to constantly fluctuate based off of what people choose to enroll. So like right now in open enrollment, we have no clue what people are going to do for January 1st. Um, and then over time, as uh, events happen, people might add family members, remove family members. It's constantly fluctuating. So we're transferring money as we see the need to be able to transfer money to pay those premiums. That's interesting. Very different than uh, private sector. Um, yeah. So I was a little concerned to hear that, um, and premiums go up every single year. I mean, we have to deal with this all the time. Mm -hmm. um, do you see any challenges coming from that? Um, I mean, it sounds like it'll be another $40 million, perhaps, that we have to pay. It, it could be. It could very well be for um, for next year. Um, it, it is a challenge, I think, in just being able to curb that on a regular basis, um, as this is exactly to your point, like it's going to continue and, and become a point where it's potentially not affordable. Um, so just looking for different ways, looking for different ways to provide this program is uh, is what we're trying to investigate and look at. Yeah. Is, is the city in the same situation as, as a lot of unions or like Kaiser, like the biggest player in town? It's just hard to get something that has the same level of network and services. That so is the same, same thing. situation, yes. Wow. Okay. Um, when, when's the last time, not that I'm advocating for this, uh, but I'm just curious for historical reasons, when was the last time there was a change to the benefits, like maybe increasing co-pays or things like that? 2013. 2013. Yeah, that's okay. that's when we actually changed providers from Blue Shield to, to Anthem, and that's when there was a, a big change. The city was a different place back then, by the way, so there was uh, different ways or different looks at finances at that time as well. Yeah. 
is there, uh, and again, I'm not advocating for that because I went through that many times. I know how difficult it can be, but is there any other, other than making changes to, uh, you know, the benefits or employee contributions, any ideas that y'all can think of that could help save us some money? Like that's maybe on, on the burner right now? We're, well, we're looking at everything we can look at. Okay. Um, there's lots of ideas, but uh, nothing's materialized yet as far as a, as a process. Anything that we do for the most part is going to be probably through a procurement process though. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm sure you'll come here uh, if there's some serious challenges with, with the funds and we got to talk about. But thank you so much for that information. Thank you. Uh, hearing no other questions, uh, I move that we note and file this report. And thank you for your time. Can you call the roll? Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Cusker? Yes. Council, Council Member Padilla? Yes. And Councilmember Soto Martinez. Yes. Yes, this item is noted and filed. Thank you very much. We will then move to item number six. Could you read that into the record? Thank you. Item number six is a report from the Bureau of Engineering relative to the improvements to the city's sidewalk programs. And this item was approved as amended by the Public Works Depart uh, Public Works Committee on September 27th. Thank you very much. We're joined by engineering. Could you? Hi, good morning. Thank you. Yourself uh, and give us a brief report. Sure, uh, Ted Allen, city engineer with the Bureau of Engineering, joined by Julia Sanchez de la Vega, the head of our sidewalk repair program, and Natalie Sparrow, our ADA coordinator. Thank you. Uh, I'll give, uh, obviously this could go on for hours with the history, so I'll give the brief version <laughs> and I'm happy to answer, you know, whatever questions you have. Yeah. Uh, a little bit of background going back many years under uh, the state's Highway code, uh, property owners are responsible for maintenance of sidewalks. But some years, decades back, the city changed the municipal code to voluntarily be responsible for repairing tree root damage. Um, fast forward to 2016, well, actually before 2016, we had a settlement agreement settled in 2016, but of course the discussion started earlier. Um, the city had not been addressing the tree root damage and the city had not been enforcing against property owners the non-tree root damage, the repair of those. So in 2016, we entered into a settlement, a sidewalk settlement agreement, often referred to as the Willits Sidewalk Settlement Agreement, uh, which committed the city to doing a certain amount of repairs, uh, escalating over time, 30, $35 million per year up to you know, every five years it escalates. Uh, so we have been doing that, but as soon as the program started, we were quickly overwhelmed with requests, much more than that dollar amount could cover. And so um, in 2021, the controller, late 2021, the controller issued an audit of the sidewalk uh, program, uh, addressing some different recommendations or providing some different recommendations of how the city could more efficiently affect these sidewalk repairs. Uh, in the Bureau of Engineering has been the program manager of the sidewalk repair program since it initiated, as far as the Willett settlement compliance goes, uh, Streets LA or the Bureau of Street Services, they're still the owner operator of the sidewalk, so they still have responsibilities outside of the sidewalk repair program uh, for regular maintenance. And so some of the things highlighted in the controller's audit from 2021, I'll, I'll go into a little bit more detail when I get to the item related to fix and release, but some of the things they addressed or recommended was that we should prioritize work differently so that we're addressing the worst conditions first. Uh, that was one recommendation. And then also recommendations to change what's, cons what's called the fix and release program and then also a recommendation to do in a citywide assessment of sidewalks. Um, so going to those first two items, so the report in front of you today from the Bureau of Engineering is in response to that, but also in response to a council motion, as you're well aware, I'm sure, um, you know, it's, we're, we have a backlog of many years of, of sidewalk requests. And so the council has also asked us to look into ways that we could expedite these or repair more things. So the report in front of you, recommendations one and two have to do with changing the prioritization matrix that has been approved by city council to add um, prioritization criteria for um, severity of damage, which we think will help greatly with getting rid of the worst cases earlier. And also uh, equity concerns, so looking at 
uh, neighborhoods where people are using um, transit and walking more, you know, a, a criteria for that as well. For both the access request program and for city facilities. Recommendation three has to do with fix and release. Well, what's referred to as fix and release. So around that time when we entered into the settlement agreement, city council also had a desire at that time to get rid of this voluntary role we had responsibility we had taken on to repair tree root damage. But in defining returning that back to the property owner, city council wanted to first fix the problem, fix the sidewalk, I should say, before returning it back, but then wanted to kind of be rid of that responsibility. Well, in defining what that meant to fix it before returning it, the municipal code as it's currently written, it says that we will make the whole frontage compliant with current ADA standards, which is, is much kind of beyond what, uh, what our prior responsibility was. So I think um, maybe accidentally we took on much more responsibility than we had had at that point, uh, basically replacing almost all of the sidewalks in the city because as we looked into it, you know, part of ADA compliance standards is what's called the cross slope of the sidewalk, how much it slopes sideways as you're walking on it. Um, American Disabilities Act allows for one inch of drop over 48 inches of sidewalk, which comes out to about 2%. So we often say it's 2% requirement, but it's it's two to 96, it's slightly more than 2%. <laughs> Most sidewalks, ex like an inch inch. yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I had to throw that in there. Um, but you know, almost every sidewalk in the city was built at more than 2%. So a lot of sidewalks you'd look at that say, oh, that sidewalk looks great. Well, it's more than 2%, so we can't return the responsibility to the property owner under the current without replacing it. So in the beginning of our program with these kind of two, we have the Willett Settlement Agreement, we have the fix and release. What we would do when we got an access request um, from mobility impaired community, we would go out, in the very beginning, we would fix the whole block. We're like, well, we're there, we might as well do the whole block. Uh, oftentimes, a lot of that block was in pretty good shape, and so we weren't getting through many of the access requests. Quickly, we were falling way behind, and we saw, okay, this isn't working. So then we scaled it back to just doing individual property frontages. So if we had a property with a big uplift or whatnot, and we're out there fixing it, we would fix the whole frontage of that property uh, so that we could do the certificate of completion for fix and release and start the, there's actually a warranty period under the release as well, but it would start that warranty period returning the responsibility for maintenance back to the property owner. Well, even that we were still falling way behind and we were replacing a fair amount of sidewalk that was actually in good shape. You know, it was just the cross slope for a lot of it. So around the time of the audit coming out, we were also at that time also kind of recognizing ourselves that um, we need to not do the full frontages. So from that, for the last few years, we've essentially been doing only the individual barriers that are reported as far as our repair program. But what that means is under the fix and release that's in the city's code, we're really not returning those back to the property owners. We're not, there is no program to do those full frontages. And I think a lot of us would argue it's probably not worth doing those until we get rid of all these significant barriers that we have in the city. So with you know the controller recommended changes to fix and release, they didn't think it makes sense to replace this good, pretty good sidewalk, you know. Um, so, and we, we agree. So we started looking at different options to change it. Well, the city council, one doesn't have any um, obligation to do the fix before releasing, could just release it back now without doing anything, but that would kind of you know, go back on what was said before, it would probably not be a very palatable option. Uh, or we could go back to redefining what it means to fix to be in line with what the city's original obligation was. And that was my initial uh, recommendation and it is still an option that's on the table. and. Um, the, the tricky thing with that though is let's say, let's say we're only gonna define um, fix and release as we'll fix the tree root damage or significant barriers, then we're re returning responsibility to the property owner. The, 
the flip side to that though is that means to, to get those sidewalks fixed where the city doesn't have responsibility we'd have to cite the property owners and have them fix it and you know as the audit pointed out we have about 640,000 properties so let's say half of those go back well that means we need to start citing 300,000 property owners or so and, and it's probably maybe I just made up a half but just to give an idea I don't know what the actual number is so the current code though as it's written to to order us a property owner to comply and repair you have to do a, a board report to our board of public works it's a very long kind of bureaucratic process so so no matter what we see that the current code needs some changes what's before you today would not actually change it outright at this time or it wouldn't even ask the city attorney to draft the ordinance at this point it's to get approval from the city council to pursue these options for changing fix and release. And then we, we would go back, work up um, some options in more detail, come back before city council. And then at that point, city council would choose an option or give direction if they wanna move forward. And then at that point, probably request an ordinance from city attorney or send us back to develop more options or whatnot. But I just wanted to point out the recommendations today for prioritization would just be conceptual approval to move forward with incorporating severity and equity. We'll go back and, and develop those and bring them back. And then on the fix and release would conceptually give us approval to move forward with um, developing more detail on proposals for changing fix and release. And then you know we'll go back and report back with those and so that was the short version i'm sorry that's probably about as short as i could do but did want to give some background and with that i'm happy to take any questions you have thanks very much just a uh, a few for me so we'll stick with fix and release i hate the term but yeah. <laughs> stick with it for now so we have because this has been in place for a while presumably we have a a quantity of sidewalk that has been fixed and released today. Correct. It's it's a little less than 1% of those properties that I mentioned. That, that was my next question. Thank you. So a little less than 1% of all properties or a little less than 1% of properties that we deem need repair? We haven't done a citywide assessment, so we don't know how many need repair, but I think the need repair as it's currently defined would be almost all properties, so it, it's probably okay. about that number. Actually, the your answer is helpful because it, ultimately, whether I agree or disagree with fix and release, to be uniform, the goal would be to fix and or release of all sidewalks. That would be, presumably, that's the current goal. That That's we release the current it all back code, right. to residents to fix, essentially, to maintain uh, in perpetuity, which I would guess would come as a shock to 99% of our residents. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, most people are very surprised to hear that under state law, their property owners are responsible for maintenance of sidewalks. Yeah, and they don't blame state law. No. <laughs> in this side yeah, of the state. They don't call the state. Not right. the state law <laughs> in their minds. Uh, and that's understandable because of where, because of the discretion that we have and the decisions that we've made in the past to maintain and fix. So we've, 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 is that my microphone going on though? It's been doing the static since before we started. I don't know where it's coming from. Really? Okay. Um, so the fix and release has been in place about how long? Uh, that's a good question. Since it was around the time well, it's yeah, finished. It's so around 2016, 16, 17. Yeah. Uh, and the circumstance we find ourselves in, which I think confounds a lot of folks, that engineering is responsible for the cuts and the access and the, a big chunk of the sidewalk program in Streets LA is responsible for sidewalks. Is that an accident of history because Willits, because of the Willits case? and, and and engineering wound up being the responsive party during the litigation? Yeah, what happened, so Bureau of Engineering wasn't even one of the key players in the Willett settlement negotiations. We weren't at the table. It was mainly Streets LA and CAO, but once there was an agreement to do this sidewalk repair program and spending you know, over 30 million a year, 
because Bureau of Engineering often uh, delivers a lot of capital projects and have a number of capital programs, it was decided that Bureau of Engineering would run that sidewalk repair program for the Willett settlement. Mm -hmm. But the rest of the responsibility stayed with Streets LA um, as far as regular maintenance, and they're still the owner of the asset, you know, they have their asset management. But it did create a lot of confusion and I think that's something, you know, we've been working with the mayor's office and others to, I think we need to kind of clarify those roles for everyone. The confusion continues to today. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, folks, the what folks believe about city government, about our this government, is that it's this morass, this labyrinth that you can get stuck in and never come out of. And this is one of the examples that you guys do the access program, you cut the curbs, the willets, people throw out numbers and they throw out the billion dollars and where's the billion dollars and, and folks don't know to call you or to call Streets LA or yeah, in recent call years, names. Right, in recent years, so we've the Willett settlement has been funded. There's a certain prioritization, so we abide by that. Um, so if they're mobility impaired and they're part of a, a qualified access request, then they'll be on our wait list and they'll go towards our program. The In the city, we really haven't funded a complement to that of the non-Willets just, you know, and so Streets LA doesn't get a big batch of money to do sure. regular requests. And so, so let me go to that then. So you have a, a sub fund for access, for mobility, for, for basically um, access impaired you mm -hmm. know, folks. Um, how, what percentage of your funding is in that sub fund? So under the settlement agreement, we're obligated to spend at least 20% towards access requests. The other 80% of sidewalk repairs, the city could use different prioritization. However, we've received so many access requests under the program. In recent years, we've been spending near um, near 100%, quite honestly, on access requests other than some money for city facilities. So there really hasn't been a non-access request program. The prioritization that we would bring back under item one of the report today with severity and equity, part of that discussion too is, does the city wanna start using a portion of the settlement agree, a larger portion of the settlement agreement money uh, towards non-access requests? That's part of the discussion then. So, so I'm sure all three of us out on the campaign trail had this, you know, because it's the easiest thing to do on the campaign trail is talk about how broken the city is. Mm -hmm. The hardest thing, if you win, is to <laughs> fix the brokenness. Right. So the example of, hey, you know, the city's broken because we, we're spending billions of dollars to do these beautiful cuts at every intersection, but you can't get, if you're mid-block, you can't get there. And if you want to go from here to here, you can't get there because it's broken in the middle. And we don't know, nobody knows whether it's engineering or it's street, Streets LA. And, and a little secret is if you say it's for mobility access, you'll go to the front of the list, but we don't know what that means. So it's a totally, completely broken and confusing system. And so I, I appreciate that this report's gonna come back with, with uh, recommendations for how we, for prioritizing the, you know, the, the most uh, in need places, and I'm all for that. Who's going to be the one that puts together the priorities? So the Bureau of Engineering would do the scoring for our program, So, uh, but one of the important pieces, so severity right now, if we had severity in our prioritization matrix right now, we wouldn't be able to do it because we don't know the condition of all the sidewalks in the city. So there's another report we released with this one. It didn't get referred to this committee, but it's moving forward as well, which would authorize us to start a pilot for us doing a condition assessment of the city. And that was also something identified by the controller in their audit as a need. So the two working together, if, if we come back and then the city council approves adding severity to our prioritization matrix. We do need to assess the condition of the sidewalks in the city to really know, you know, because it needs to be done in an automated way. There's thousands of these requests. Then we'd be able to uh, include severity in that scoring. But under our program, we would score it. If, if another program's created under Streets LA or outside of uh, SRP, well, with whatever department, that scoring could be done separately by whoever's running that and program. Presumably, ultimately, since it all comes back to money and, and personnel and hiring, because we have to have bodies to do the work, 
we'd have to have sort of the Willits money and the non Willits money. They would have to be proportionate to solve the problem. Yeah, and there is some money in the current year's budget, some additional money beyond Willits that was in the budget. And we do, along with the CAO, a report back on what other departments would need to ramp up sidewalk spending. But I think part of that discussion also will be, okay, what what's done with that? Is it extra access requests? Is it non-access requests? You know, that's beyond the annual commitment towards Willits, but depending how we spend it, it may count towards banking kind of extra um, money to the settlement agreement in case we are short in a future year or whatnot, but that's up to the city's discretion. Uh, last question for me. Are there any in the, in the, the Public Works Committee recommendations that we are proposing to concur with, as you look at it, is there anything more you need to be able to come back with a competent set of strategies to solve the problems? No, I don't think so. We, we got good input. So Public Works Committee's input was they may not want to do away with fix and release in its entirety. So they wanted some kind of in-between options. Maybe commercial properties will get released and then what would that release look like? So we'll, we'll come back with a few different options for consideration. So I guess the only thing would be if you had unique input beyond that. Um, but I think we'll have different options that will, um, you know, provide a good palette to choose from. Thank you. Madam Vice Chair. Yes, I, I want to uh, talk about, you mentioned that, you know, I like the idea of taking an assessment. I'm always uh, pro assessments and figuring out what's truly out there. Uh, but I wanted to ask uh, what's going to be the process? What are going to be your priorities? What are the engineering type questions that are going to be asked to develop your uh, matrices to be able to, um, you know, measure severity and figure out a way to make this completely automated if, if possible. And are you going to talk to tree experts? Like who's going to be at the table to, to really develop this? And then what's the execution plan? So the plan for the prioritization pilot that we are uh, proposing to move forward with um, would be to look at what technologies are out there to assess the sidewalk to see what can do it most cheaply, quickly, and effectively. We don't need it to be an engineering tool to know to the hundredth of an inch everything to be able to design from. We'll go back and do that for the sites that come to the top of the prioritization and get selected. We just need a tool that can put them in kind of baskets of condition and, and we will come and the proposal we come back with would propose so maybe it's three or four or five different kind of levels of severity whatever we do we need to be able to do it in an automated way so in the pilot we'll look at okay what could do this assessment and give us the data we need so that later if severity is part of the prioritization it can just using our GIS tool automatically assign that value based on the input and so that, that will be our focus of something that's, you know, least expensive, relatively accurate, and then can enable us to do this in an automated manner. Okay, my question was going to be, what, what exactly is that tool? So you're going to GIS the program out. Will that be information that people will be able to access as you, as you start to put this together? Yeah, once we have it, we'll make it available through our Navigate LA as far as, you know, like we do with our other data layers. The process of gathering it, to get it into the GIS, there's a few different tools. Um, there's a company that uses iPhones and the LiDAR and you walk it and the iPhone LiDAR captures data and then it uses probably AI to process it. There's a company we've already started um, looking at a little bit that uses a robot to, to go over the sidewalk and collect data. There's another company that has approached us or that we saw at a national convention that uses kind of more traditional means. And so we'll just see from each of those during the pilot, what we've started using Echo Park Lake as the pilot area. We're gonna survey the area with our surveyors. We'll test these different technologies and see not only how long does it take them, what does it cost, but how closely do their results uh, match the actual conditions there. Um, okay, I always mess up these words, but it almost sounds like, I, I like that you're thinking through utilizing new technologies in addition to the traditional GIS that I know everybody has on hand. 
Um, but you have to use a combination, in my opinion, of both qualitative and quantitative data. So in addition to, you know, engaging in the technologies, I hope that the the data gathering process can also include reaching out to current nonprofits that have maybe in the past uh, been received grants where they have community-based assessments made, um, just kind of as a way to kind of guide you guys, because I, I, I've, always, I've always not been a fan of um, knowledge, knowledge being left on the table when we know that it's been funded, it's out there, and it should also help to inform this sort of, decision, this sort of decisions. Yeah, it's a good point, and, and that will be something else I'm sure that our pilot will look at would be crowdsourcing options, whether as the main thing or as a supplemental thing, um, you know, so that uh, community could uh, upload, you know, reports or whatnot, and so we have talked about that yeah, as Yeah, like well. I'm sure there's already a big amount of data that's been accumulated for sidewalks on the 311. Uh, LA, lots of people have, have enjoyed using that, mm -hmm. so I, I just... I just hope it's thorough and that we look within our own backyard for, for all of the data, both at the city level and, you know, relative nonprofits that, that care about built environment and probably already have some stuff in their archives. Yeah, and I think it's a good point that, you know, because we have about 9,000 miles of sidewalk. So whatever assessment plan we do, it is going to take a while to do it. And um, so using 311 data or liability data might be a way to prioritize which areas are being assessed first because it's not like it'll all happen instantly at once. Mm -hmm. um, probably would want to do them a little bit separately by council district. You know, the, the risk to using the 311 data is some communities are much quicker to complain than others, and yeah. so we don't want to necessarily <laughs> leave out the communities that I didn't that. have time to report But that's it. what I mean about engaging uh, community nonprofits that have been funded to do community-based assessments, right? Um, those, uh, that kind of, if, if, if the nonprofit itself is sophisticated and has, you know, access to GIS, it's probably already embedded within their information, but I think it takes the city an active a role to be able to say, what have you guys tracked over the last couple of years, um, especially for those communities that maybe won't utilize the 311, such so as places like ELAC and Boyle Heights, right, Pacoma Beautiful in the East Valley, uh, Coco in, in, you know, South LA. So I'm pretty sure they have some stuff on their archives. Yeah, I, and we'll see during the pilot, and depending which technology is chosen, but if it's, let's say, the robot or the, the iPhone AI, more than likely they'll be a little bit separate but coordinated. Like the, the person walking the iPhone with the AI, mm. they're not going to be the one to do community outreach. We'll just want them 9,000 miles. they got to blow through it. But, but we can work with the council offices on how to you know, how to get that message out of what we're doing and also maybe a tool for them to augment that data and report things that are high priority to them or whatnot. Okay, yeah, because I want to make sure that you guys know exactly where the trees are obstructing. And that'll be one of the other things we look at in the pilot. So one thing is which one's best for assessing sidewalks, but let's say two are about equal, but, a, but one of them can also map trees and other things or that at the same time, then those other um, synergies will be considered in, in develop, you know, selecting or recommending, selecting which one to recommend to city council, I should say. Thank you very much, Council Member. Yes, thank you so much, Mr. Chair. I think that's a great idea, Council Member Padilla, by using the community um, as much as possible. Um, well, first of all, I'm very happy that you're starting in the Echo Park Lake. Uh, <laughs> I, I, hope, I hope the geese were not a problem uh, as you're walking around. Uh, no, look, I think this is, um, you know, I was very early on when I, when, I, when, I, when I won, right, my team and I had the opportunity to meet with uh, your department. And I was really, like, shocked that how the sidewalk program works. And so I'm, I'm really excited to, to see us, like, taking a more holistic approach, a more citywide approach. Uh, especially walking those or having the robot, right, do the 9,000 miles. I, I think whenever we're going to start something this big, you got to know where you're at, right? And so we don't even have that. And so it's very exciting to, to know that we're doing that. Um, but I guess my question will, just one, is just a question of, of, of funding. Like, is there, at the end of the day, that's it's going to matter, right? Any, any sense of what potentially, well, number one, having goals. So we if, say we map the 9,000 miles. We want to say, 
within 10 years. I mean, I think that's what the public wants to know. It's like, how long is it going to take to get up to, up to standard, right? Uh, any sense of what that would look like? Like, is it 10 years? Is it 15 years? 20 years to try to get all these streets up to, up to code or up to the standards we want? So, well, multiple, as far as getting them all to full ADA standards, I think, you know, you're looking beyond 100 years at, at the rate we're going now, it will be a long time. But to get rid of the significant barriers, hopefully would be much less, but that we won't know until we do the assessment. We really don't know the number of significant barriers that are out there. Um, so that's where the assessment will really help us um, do better long-term planning just by knowing what the conditions are. So, so if, uh, is, is this report going to have what I would say a goal or a vision for the city, right? I, 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 for me, I think it would be helpful to come back to council and say, we want to do it in 20 years, like, you know, get everything up to code. Uh, is there any so component that that's, this report will have? So the, the, the report right now, the, the companion report to this, which didn't get referred to this committee, but the assessment pilot, it would just come back with a recommendation of which assessment method to use for the city and the amount of money it would take to do a citywide assessment. Then following up on that, let's say we do a citywide assessment. At that point, we'll have a good understanding of the condition of the sure. sidewalks in the city. I think at that time would be when we would be able to make a recommendation of you know, what length of program probably makes sense to, and let's say we have four different categories of, of severe, of damage. Okay, the top category, we have this many sites. At the current rate, it would take this many years. If we wanted to do more funding, it would take this year. So we'll, we'll be able to give a much better picture for the first time, because we've never, never had an understanding yeah. of all the sidewalks in the city. So I think it will be a, a you know, a essential tool. If I may. Um, how long it will take depends on the city's desired approach, right? Once we have the information like Ted has said, it goes back to recommendation number three. How do we want to keep fix and release on the books or do you desire for it to be modified? Because it's the city's approach which is going to dictate whether we're citing property owners to fix the, re the problems or the city is going out and fixing it itself or some combination thereof the approach then determines how long it's going to take to fix. And so that's how number three here relates to that pilot assessment. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Sort of, except we, yeah, if we keep it as it currently is, we have to do the fix first. If we got rid of that, you're right. So the, the two will, will be together in that discussion. So, so I, I thank you for explaining that nuance because we still don't know which model we're going to go. You, you know, it, it's, it's true that uh, the council oftentimes gives a lot of, recommendation or, or vision, however you want to describe it, but truly y'all are the experts, right? Uh, y'all are the, the folks that, that know this is forwards and backwards, you know, uh, backwards and forwards, uh, you know, and I know this is not the time, but I want to sort of plant the seed, right, that um, personally, right, I would love at the time for when, when that report comes back for a sort of a, a menu of options, right? Like if we went this route, it would take us 50 years. If we did a combination of this and funding, it would take us 10 years, right? Because it gives, for me, as a council, say, okay, I, I know the different options, I know what it would take, and what does it take to achieve the goal that I want, mm -hmm. right? It's very similar to what we're facing in the district right now. We, you know, I ran on a platform of, of, of doing more protected bike lanes, right? And so I, I want to build you know, five miles in my first term, right? So, and, and I say that to the public. So having that sort of level, of if you can give us that level of transparency and knowledge, I think would be incredibly helpful for, for me personally. I think a lot of folks on this committee, yep. because then we can go back to our constituents and say, the city has a vision, we have a goal of doing it in 20 years. Even if it's not five years, a lot of folks want it now, mm -hmm. but many times our constituents are even happy to know that there is a plan, yep. right? And there's a yeah. plan, it might take 20 years, but there's a plan. And so giving us that level of detail, I think, would be incredibly helpful. Agreed. And, yeah, we'll be able to do that once the once we have the assessment of the city yeah. done. Or we'll be able to give you a lot more useful information. I'm looking forward to it so much. Thank you so much for everything you're doing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Did you have another question? Um, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing this assessment, more like a comment. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I would just kind of say that in the report back or in the uh, whoever or however you utilize go about 
you know, gathering the data and then being able to present it in a way where, you know, it kind of presents, where it presents the options of prioritization and spending over a timeline. Uh, I just recommend using a lot of graphic models as much as possible. You know, tap into the creativeness of using tools like AI and GIS, um, you know, bring on the statisticians uh, to give us, you know, good looking graphs um, because that's always really helpful and it just kind of makes it easier for for picking mm -hmm. what what route to go towards. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Great, thank you. Thanks very much. Big, complicated topic, a lot of history. <laughs> I appreciate uh, how you boiled it down uh, for this discussion. If there's no other questions, I'm gonna move that we concur with the Public Works Committee action, which was of September 27th, 2023, to approve the BA, BOE recommendations with amendments. Uh, can you call the roll? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councilmember McCusker. Yes. Councilmember Padilla. Yes. And Councilmember Soto Martinez. Yes. Three yeses, and this item is uh, we concurred with Public Works. Thank you so much. Uh, we will now move to item number seven. Uh, can you read the item into the record, Mr. Clerk? Thank you. Item number seven is a report from the Los Angeles City Employees Retirement System, or LACERS. Um, report in. Uh, response to the adopted budget recommendation relative to increasing diversity and equity in LACERS investment program. Thank you very much. We're joined by LACERS. If you could identify yourself and give us a brief report. Good morning. I'm Todd Bowie, Assistant General Manager with LACERS, and uh, our featured speaker here is to my left. Good morning, Council Members. My name is Wilkin Lee. I am Investment Officer 3 with uh, LACERS Investment Division. Great. Thank you. So what we have before you is a report on the LACERS Emerging Manager Program. Uh, just by way of background, um, what we do here is represent a report on our newer established managers, and these are typically managers in the high growth phase who have typically spun out from larger investment management firms. While emerging managers are typically usually smaller in size, industry research suggests that these firms are often diverse owned businesses. As requested by the, bu the Budget, Finance, and Innovation Committee back on May 2nd, what we have shown here in the support is the extent that we've utilized emerging managers in our investment portfolio. As noted in table one of the report, out of our $22.2 billion portfolio as of August 31st, we have 1.3 billion of commitments allocated to emerging managers. And this is a very healthy allocation as it represents roughly 5.8% of our overall portfolio. The emerging manager definition varies by, varies by asset class, but typically is reserved for first, second or third time institutional funds, and typically less than two billion in asset sizes. And we do that just to make sure that we have the smaller size, uh, smaller size investment manager firms being considered to keep out the mid and large size firms to make sure they're deserving of our capital. As requested by the council, we've also calculated that 715 million, 715 million in assets have officially graduated from our emerging manager portfolio. And that's 3.2% of our overall portfolio. We've defined these as managers who have gotten too large that do not fit in our firm uh, manager, emerging manager policy definitions. So with that, I'll be glad to take any questions on our report. Thank you very much. Um, so do we do we do have a, a look back or an analysis of actually how diverse our emerging managers are? So we have a, uh, we did analysis of firm ownership and that's defined as 50% or more owned by underrepresented groups. And that came up to around 21% of our overall portfolio. So we have a very robust ownership of the, the general partners uh, that own the firm. How would that compare if we looked at the large firms? I, I presume it compares favorably on the issue of promoting diversity, but how, what does it look like in the, in the largest firms on, on diverse ownership or diverse top management? Yeah, I think we have a pretty good representation in terms of our portfolio. Generally, we have smaller firms that have more minority ownership as compared to the larger publicly traded firms, or obviously those are uh, shareholders. But in terms of larger firms, I think our portfolio does fairly well, given that we have this concentration on emerging managers within our portfolio. Mm -hmm. um, are there are there modifications uh, to the policy for um, uh, for emerging managers and promoting diversity that you? that you all are looking at now? Or, yeah. or do you feel like we're on a good trajectory? I think we, our board has uh, emphasized the importance of developing our emerging manager portfolio. Um, on an aspirational goal, we have a policy goal of committing no less than 10% to emerging managers. 
Um, so we're also very much um, in a very inclusive environment where we have an emerging manager symposium, we have an emerging manager networking forums, and those, um, those, those situations we actually go out and meet the emerging manager community, when then we'll have introductions to our investment consultants, and also develop long-term relationships with emerging managers. So this is an emphasis that we will continually bring up with our you know, investment consultants, with our board, uh, so it's a very uh, high priority within the uh, investment division. When, when we have a success um, of an emerging manager firm that is truly diverse and doing a good job for us and grows and outgrows our program, how do we, uh, how do we work with that firm off into the future to make sure that we're you know, creating opportunity behind them? Yes, that's a very good question. We have a kind of a graduation policy, that's what we call it, where essentially they've outgrown the limits that we've specified. Those firms will be in consideration for our core portfolio, so we will still consider them alongside our established managers. So we want to make sure that those emerging managers who've outgrown the definition still get considered alongside uh, our, our existing larger managers as well. That's great. Yeah, that's great. Colleagues, questions? Madam Vice Chair. Uh, I want to say, uh, tell us about them. What's how, what's the experience like? What are you, what are you uh, what are they doing? What, what markets are they in? Sure. No, they uh, they actually represent a very broad class of of, of of different investable universe. So we have emerging managers in the public equity space, public fixed income. Uh, credit opportunities, and also they're more prevalent, I would say, in the private market space, which consists of private equity, private real estate, private credit. So these are typically managers that have come up from the larger established firms, think Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, and they've decided to spin out and start their own firm. So what they've done is a, they've taken the institutional knowledge that they've had at these larger firms and start up these firms, and then again, they're generally um, diverse on businesses, and what we've seen is that generally we get a lot of attention from these firms. They they want to raise capital. They want a long-term partner, and as a result, Lasers is very sticky capital. Obviously, we will be wound in, around in perpetuity, so we provide uh, capital to them. At the same time, we have access to their investments. Sometimes we sit on their limited partner advisory council, so we understand the ins and outs of their investments. So typically we found that we've had a very good uh, relationship with emerging managers. The fact they're smaller, more nimble, they're more responsive to our, our, our inquiries. Um, so overall we felt there's a, a very positive relationship on both ends. Okay. Um, I, uh, I, I'm sorry, that just continues to sound a little bit real general for me. Right. I'm just curious, like so, um, I pass. That's good. That's good enough for me for now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Five percent. No other questions. Well, thank you. Thank you. This is uh, this is our money. I mean, every single one of us works for the city, uh, contributes to this program, and so it's it is great to see our investments in our future also building the future of other folks. So thank you very much. I'm going to recommend that we. Um, not receive. Note and file. Note and file this report. Uh, can you call the roll? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councilmember Bukasker. Aye. Councilmember Padilla. And Councilmember Soto Martinez. C. Um, we got we... three C's, and this item is noted and filed. And do we have anything left on the desk? No, the desk is clear. All right. We are adjourned. Thanks, guys. Thank Appreciate it. Thank you. You guys are so comical. Seek. What? You're all so comical. <laughs> Spoken like a true engineer was my favorite joke today. I've <laughs> spoken like an engineer. That was funny. Good. It was like, it's not 2%, it's 2.0016%. 99. Of